Today we're going to talk about Islam, which is the third great monotheism of the world. Islam is very important to study because it's a religion that is very much in our media today, but I feel is one that is very often misunderstood. Islam, as I said, is the third great monotheism of, of the world and sees itself as both a continuation and a completion of the religious lineage that starts with Judaism, runs through Christianity, and then, according to Muslims, finds its, its perfection, really, in the religion of Islam. But it's important to know that these three religious traditions are very intimately connected. Islam begins with Muhammad, a man who lived in the Arabian Peninsula in present-day Saudi Arabia from 570 to 632 CE. Muhammad was from a prominent tribe, the tribe of Quraysh, and lived in Mecca, which was the capital of Arabia at the time. Arabia was a very religiously diverse area at this time. There were Jews and Christians and also polytheistic tribes who each had their own individual tribal gods and goddesses. The Kaaba was already there, which is a large structure covered in black cloth, which becomes very important in Islam as well. But the Kaaba does predate Islam. It was a place where each, each tribe kept their own statues of their gods or goddesses and would come to worship it during one month out of the year. This was done for security reasons as the tribal culture outside of Mecca was considered to be a very dangerous one. Muhammad was against this polytheism and would leave town during this month to go to meditate and pray to God. Muhammad was a devout man who believed in monotheism, though he wasn't a Jew or a Christian. A lot of people at that time did believe that there was one high God. Each year, he would go for a month to a local mountain, Mount Hira, to meditate, contemplate, and have sort of a spiritual retreat. When he was 40 years old, he went to this mountain, and there the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him to recite. This was the first word that the angel said to him. This scared Muhammad very much, and he went and told his wife, Khadija, and his uncle, who both believed him and believed his story. They took him to a relative who was a Christian, and this relative said that it was God, the same God that Jews and Christians worship, who had spoken to him. Muhammad kept receiving these revelations from God, and he told them to those around him, and he soon had a small following of Muslims, which literally means those who submit to God. So the word Islam actually translates to submission uh, in Arabic, and Muslims are those who submit, those who submit to God. So this was how Islam started, where people in sort of Muhammad's life, his family, his friends, who believed that he was receiving these revelations and began to follow him and, and follow these revelations that he was receiving. The early Muslim community was not welcomed, however, by the government in Mecca, and they were forced to flee to another town called Medina, which was a bit farther off. This flight is known as the Hijra, and it marks the beginning of the first Muslim community, and also the first year of the Muslim calendar. In Medina, Muhammad continued to receive revelations from God and set up the first Muslim community. After fighting for several years with the government at Mecca, Mecca finally surrendered to Muhammad and converted to Islam. Islam was instated as the official religion in Mecca in 630 CE and spread very rapidly from there. After the death of Muhammad in 632, as I said, uh, Islam did spread very quickly, and within a few hundred years, the Islamic Empire spread from southern France through northern Africa, the Middle East, and, and even into Asia. Um, so it was a, a very quickly spreading religious tradition, and today there are about 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. So it's the second most popular religion in the world behind Christianity, uh, but it's also the fastest growing religion. So within our lifetimes, it's very uh, possible that Islam could become um, the number one religion in terms of numbers, and Christianity would be second. In terms of myths of origin, uh, the, the Muslim creation story says that God created the, the world in a single act, just as in Christianity and Judaism. Also, the Quran, which is the sacred book of Islam, which we'll talk more about later, records the story of Adam and Eve as the first human beings, but it's a different text, and there are some key differences between the two stories. In the Quranic version of the Adam and Eve story, Adam eats the forbidden fruit first, and then Eve, but they are both held equally responsible by God. 
Furthermore, when God discovers what they have done, Adam and Eve repent furiously to God, and God eventually forgives them. So there is no idea of a concept of original sin in Islam. Also, God doesn't banish Adam and Eve from the garden, um, but he sends them to earth as his representatives to teach others about God. So in the Quranic version of this story, Adam and Eve um, are considered equal, they are forgiven by God, and they're also considered the first prophets, um, and the idea of prophethood is very important in Islam, which we'll talk about later. Uh, furthermore, in, in the Quran, when God created the world, it's considered that all of the natural world was Muslim, as in some, someone or something that submits to God's plan, submits to God's will, um, that they naturally do that. They don't have their own will, but they naturally follow their instincts, which were instilled by God. It's only humans that have a choice of whether or not to submit to God and to live according to his plan, or not to submit to something else. So in Islam, the goal of human life is to choose to worship God by living according to his plan that's described by Muhammad and the Quran. Um, or you can choose to not do it. That becomes a sort of central, uh, central question and central tension in Islam is that this idea that human beings were the only part of creation that had free will, and therefore they have a choice in their lifetime either to submit to God or submit to something else like ourselves or something else that's very important to us. Um, however, there are, there's another, um, there's a, sorry, we'll just go on to the origins of Islam. Islam itself starts with the revelations given to Muhammad that he told to those around him, as we already mentioned. But really, Islam traces its roots back much farther, as we said, to Adam and Eve. According to Islam, God created the world and humans with free will, so humans all need God's guidance in order to be able to live according to his will. God sent this guidance in the form of prophets and messengers. These prophets received revelations by God to tell people so that they could believe in God and worship him. The li this line of prophets started with Adam and Eve and goes through all the way to Muhammad, According to the Quran, there have been 124,000 prophets throughout history, although the Quran itself only names 26 of them. These prophets include Adam, Abraham, Noah, Moses, and Jesus. All of these prophets received revelations, and three of them received a textual revelation, which became the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. According to Islam, these are all revealed texts that are sacred, and were just given to different communities and different times. So, as I said before, Islam sees itself very much in the religious lineage or religious heritage as Judaism and Christianity. It has this idea of prophethood, that there's one God, but that that one God has sent prophets since the beginning of time to express to humanity who God is and how to live according to his will, so that humans can have that choice of whether or not to submit to God or submit to something else. So they agree that all these other figures through Judaism and Christianity were legitimate prophets from God. Um, they were just um, prophets for different times and different communities, um, and that Muhammad is now the most recent and final prophet um, that God is, is sending or giving revelations to. So Islam states that Muhammad is the final prophet in this line, this long line of prophets that has been going on since the beginning of time. Um, they believe that Judaism and Christianity hadn't gotten it quite right, so God had to send a final revelation to Muhammad to sort of get everything right, everything straight. Um, therefore, they believe that even though Judaism and Christianity are, in a sense, true religions, um, Islam, as the final revelation, is the closest to God's will. So because Judaism and Christianity are religions that were set up around true prophets and true revelations, they are true religions. They are considered good and valid religions. However, Islam is seen as the sort of completion of this line um, and the perfection of it. That there were errors that had managed to get into the Torah and the Christian Bible, and those errors were corrected through the revelations to Muhammad, which became the basis of the Quran, their sacred text. Um, furthermore, Muslims trace their roots, their ancestry, back to Abraham, just as the Jews and, and Christians do. 
but they trace their ancestry back to Abraham and Hagar's son Ishmael. So if you're familiar with the biblical story of Abraham, um, before Abraham has a son with his wife Sarah, uh, he has a son with his um, basically with his slave, a woman named Hagar, that he sleeps with, and she becomes pregnant with a man named Ishmael. Um, so they trace their lineage, their heritage to Abraham back through Ishmael, as opposed to Isaac, who is uh, Sarah's son. Um, so important to note that they, they both see their, their heritage going back to that same ancestor. In terms of historical events, Islam has a, very, has a few very important events that we should talk about. The foundational event of Islam is, of course, the revelations that Muhammad heard throughout his life for 22 years, which became the Quran. Muhammad received divine revelations through the angel Gabriel that dealt with both faith and every aspect of daily life. Muhammad would recite his revelations to the Muslim community, who would write them down and commit them to memory. After his death, several people had memorized all of the revelations, and they were compiled into the Quran within 20 years of the death of Muhammad. This is really the fastest that we have a crystallization of a sacred text that we've seen so far. Most of the sacred texts that we've studied have taken decades or even hundreds of years before we get sort of the authoritative and canonical version of the text. Another very important event in Muslim history is an event called the Mirage, or the Night Ascent in English. This happened when Muhammad and the early Muslim community lived in Medina. One night, when Muhammad had an experience in which he felt that he was being taken or flying to Jerusalem. When he was in Jerusalem, he entered a room that was filled with the famous prophets of the past, including Ab Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. They all asked Muhammad to show them how to pray, and he instructed those other prophets in how to pray properly. Then he ascended from that spot and was taken up into heaven. He ascended through the seven layers of heaven and eventually came face to face with God. This experience was taken very seriously by the early Muslim community. Although some interpreted it as a physical ascent and some thought that it was more of a mystical ascent. This ascent was important because it helped show Muhammad that he was a true prophet, that he was in the line of succession from the other great prophets and the place uh, where Muhammad was believed to have landed in Jerusalem uh, is where the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem today, which is a very important holy site for Muslims in Jerusalem. Uh, this one event is what makes Jerusalem a holy city for Muslims as well, um, which, uh, you know, which, which has become one of the reasons that there's a lot of political friction between these two uh, communities in Jerusalem today. Um, so the, the mirage and the night ascent was very important, also because it determines the number of times that Muslims have to pray each day. Uh, according to the story, when Muhammad ascends through the seven layers of heaven and eventually comes face to face with God, uh, God tells Muhammad that he needs to instruct his followers that they have to pray 50 times a day. And Muhammad basically responds saying, that's really a lot. I really don't think that, that people are going to be able to do that, to pray that often. So he actually ends up negotiating with God about how many times uh, a human being needs to pray each day. Uh, and they sort of finally uh, settle on the number five, that praying five times a day is enough to sort of please God, and it's manageable enough that, that a human being could pray five times a day. Uh, so when we get to ritual, we'll talk more about the required five daily prayers. But this is the story of how, how that number was agreed upon between Muhammad and God. Um, so that's another reason why the mirage is a very uh, important event in, in the history of Islam. Uh, the death of Muhammad in 632 CE was also a momentous event, not because it changed Islam. Uh, Muhammad had always insisted that he was only human, he was not divine in any way, and that after his death, Muslims should not worship him, but worship God. The controversy after his death was that Muhammad did not name a clear successor, uh, which caused a rift in the Muslim community. Who should lead this Muslim community? This was an important question because Islam was not just a religion, but also a society with its own politics, laws, morals, etc. Some Muslims thought that Muhammad's close confidant, a man named Abu Bakr, should be the next successor but others thought that Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, should be the successor because they thought that only someone who was related to Muhammad could lead the Muslim community. 
uh, and Ali was both Muhammad's son-in-law and also his cousin. So he was um, he was a blood relative of Muhammad, and in some ways the closest to a son, um, because Muhammad actually only had daughters. He didn't have any sons that lived um, past infancy. So there wasn't sort of that automatic clear successor of, of a son. Uh, this initial split becomes the Sunni and Shia Muslims, which are the two major denominations of Islam today. And we'll talk a lot more about the differences between uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam uh, a bit later. But just important to note that for Shia Islam, a very important event in the history of Islam is known as the Battle at Karbala. This battle becomes a defining event for Shia Muslims. During this time, Hussein's, Hussein, who is Ali's son, um, so Muhammad's grandson is murdered by the Umayyad dynasty, who was a government in Baghdad that wanted to take control of the Muslim community. And this is, you know, several decades after the death of Muhammad. The assassination of Hussein is seen as an incredibly tragic event because not only Hussein, but several of Muhammad's relatives were murdered during this massacre. And it's a turning point in Shia theology. This event is actually recreated in something called Tazie plays every year in Shiite communities. Um, and it's, it's a very important holy day to remember uh, this, this very tragic event. And it uh, really does stir up a lot of emotion and sadness for this community to, um, to commemorate and memorialize this, this event that, that's seen as just really a horrific uh, tragedy that, that happened on that day. But that's a very important event for Shia Islam. Sorry. Muslims believe in a personal afterlife and the bodily resurrection of the dead. All people will either go to paradise or hell, depending on whether or not they have submitted to God in this life and how they have lived their life. Submitting to God means following God's plan. So there is not really a strong faith element that Christianity has, but it's really based on how you've lived your life. Your afterlife is determined by your own actions, and you alone are responsible for how you've chosen to live your life. There is a saying in the Quran that says that there's a book in heaven and all your actions are being recorded in this book and that your good actions count twice as much as your bad actions. And God is the ultimate judge who will decide whether or not you deserve to go to paradise or heaven uh, or to hell. Furthermore, prophets such as Muhammad are seen as intercessors or people who can sort of plead your case to God in favor of heaven. Muhammad is considered the intercessor for the Muslim community um, and many Muslims believe that Jesus is the intercessor, intercessor for Christians, and Moses is the intercessor for Jews. Um, some Muslims do look down on this view, however, because it might be seen as raising these prophets to a semi-divine status. Um, but this respect for, for these prophets is seen as the reason why Muslims will often repeat the phrase, peace be upon him, after they say the name of Muhammad or any other prophet like Jesus or Moses. Furthermore, the Quran does have an apocalyptic vision of the end of the world in which God will judge all of humanity and the world will come to an end, very similar to the Christian view of, of the end of the world. And interestingly, Jesus is also seen in Islam as the prophet who will return to usher in the end of the world, again, just as in Christianity. Uh, this day is called al qiyama in Islam, um, and Muslims believe that Jesus will return bodily to earth, will kill the Antichrist, uh, and usher in an era of peace. On the day of judgment, all souls will be judged, and, and those who have died previously will be brought back to life. So eternal life will be a possibility for everyone. But the, just to note that the uh, Muslim view of the end of the world um, is, is very, very similar to the Book of Revelations and the Christian view of the end of the world. Islam is a strictly monotheistic religion. We can even say it's a radical monotheism. Um, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the unity of God, the oneness of God. Um, and really in Islam, the worst thing you can do is to raise anything else to the level of God, to have, give God rivals, basically. For example, Islam believes that Christianity is mistaken in thinking that Jesus was divine because they believe he was only a human prophet who was speaking for God but was not God himself. Um, so this is one of the errors that Islam believes uh, sort of creeped into Christianity in the early Christian community um, that, that Islam itself is correcting, saying that all of these people like Jesus, they're not God, they're not divine, they're simply human prophets who were speaking for God. 
Um, the Muslim profession of faith begins with the words, there is no God but God. So the idea here is that nothing else in the world is God's equal, and therefore you shouldn't treat anything else as you would treat God. Um, so this, this uh, strong emphasis on monotheism is a big part of Islam. Uh, Muhammad is believed to be the messenger of God and is often referred to as the seal of the prophets. Um, not as in the animal seal, but, but if you think of a wax seal, something that would bind a letter, um, that's the, the type of seal that they're talking about. So he's the last final um, prophet. He was putting that wax seal, that ending stamp, um, on this line of prophethood. So he's really considered the last and the greatest of all the 124,000 prophets that God had sent um, since the beginning of time. The line of prophets started with Abraham, went through Moses, Joseph, Jesus, and finally to Muhammad, among many others. Muslims believe that Judaism and Christianity are both valid religions, in a sense, because they were formed around legitimate prophets and legitimately revealed texts in that the Torah and the New Testament are both texts revealed by God, so they're both considered holy scriptures. However, they do not believe that Judaism or Christianity had gotten it 100% right, so that's why God needed to send his final prophet, Muhammad. Muslims often refer to Christians and Jews as people of the book, meaning that they are all true religions built around sacred texts. So they really consider them also theologically within the same family of religions, all three of these traditions. Um, and really, Judaism and Islam are very similar theologically and in terms of their practice. Um, and interestingly, the first Muslim community in Medina had many Jewish citizens in it, and they had neighbors who were Jewish. Um, but eventually they quarreled, and Muhammad banished the Jews from their community. But it's clear that there was a good amount of Jewish influence on the emerging Muslim community. Uh, for example, early Muslims prayed facing Jerusalem, but after the quarrel with the Jews and their expulsion, Muhammad um, received a revelation that, that Muslims should pray facing Mecca, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, the Quran, which is the sacred text of Islam, is really the center of the Islamic faith, much more so than the figure of Muhammad. The word Quran simply means recitation because it is believed to contain the direct revelations that were given to Muhammad that he gave to his community. There is believed to be no corruptions of those words as they were passed from Gabriel to Muhammad to Muslims who wrote it down and, and are believed to have memorized it and wrote it down perfectly. Therefore, every word in the Quran is believed to be the direct word of God. The Quran has actually been compared to Jesus in terms of its centrality uh, in, in these two religions. Jesus is described in the New Testament as the Word of God or God made flesh, and the Quran is also seen as the direct Word of God or even a little piece of God in book form. And really the Quran is more important to Muslims than the Bible is to Christians because the Bible, though believed to be a divinely inspired text, was written by various people about Jesus. But the Quran is believed to come straight from the mouth of God through the prophet Muhammad. Um, and the Quran is often compared to Jesus' miracles in that it is held to be absolutely perfect um, and also considered to be the most beautiful piece of writing in the Arabic, uh, the Arabic language. So, important to note that a lot of times people compare the figure of Jesus to the figure of Muhammad and the Bible to the Quran because that's kind of an easy comparison. But really in terms of the roles that they play in those two traditions, Jesus and the Quran are much more similar in terms of the centrality and divine nature of those two, um, those two things within the religion. Um, so it's it's not as as good of a comparison to compare the two people um, because Jesus is considered divine. Muhammad is not considered divine. He's considered to just be a human being um, who who received revelations from God and told them, but he is not believed in any way to be more than human. Um, so important to know that, so you can know that distinction between those two, um, those two items within this tradition. Uh, it is forbidden in Islam to put a Quran on the floor to sort of disrespect the physical object of the book um, because it is so highly respected and really seen as a direct link to God in this world. It is how humans can access and connect to God. Because every word in the Quran is thought to be absolutely perfect and the exact word that God communicated, translation of it into other languages is often discouraged. 
It is translated into many different languages, but it's not actually considered the Quran once it's in, in a translation. It's only the true Quran in Arabic. So all Muslims are encouraged to learn Arabic if, if that's not their first language so that they can read the Quran in the original language. The Hadiths are second in sanctity, and these are stories that contain, uh, or sorry, they're, they're books that contain stories about the Prophet. So they're not revelations that Muhammad received from God, but they're traditions that have arisen around what the Prophet did and said of his own right. So they're not considered a sacred text, but they are still very important because they do talk about Muhammad and sort of what kind of person he was and the things he did and the things he said. Um, in a way, Muhammad's believed to be uh, a living Quran in that his life is seen as sort of a perfect example of how to live a very good, um, good life. So stories about him are, are very important in Islam because many Muslims try to emulate um, his behavior, emulate who he was as a person as much as possible. Uh, in terms of soteriology, for Muslims, humanity's main problem is their forgetfulness. Muslims believe that everyone is born with a natural faith in God and understanding of their dependence on him. But then they become influenced by the world and others, and they forget about God and mistakenly think that they are independent. So Islam is really built around a series of reminders of God, to remind people that God created them, that God is perfect, and that they have to worship God and live according to his plan. Uh, in terms of ritual, we're going to have two different slides on ritual. Uh, and the first thing that we're going to talk about are the five essential components that are required of every Muslim. These are called the pillars, the five pillars, because they are seen as the foundation of Islam. Interestingly, all our actions, although the first is a confession of faith, so it's kind of a combination of a belief and an action, um, which is similar to Judaism and a bit dissimilar to Christianity, which has more emphasis on faith. Um, there are not complicated theologies in Islam um, and sort of a, you know, a list of things that Muslims need to believe in or have faith in, as in Christianity. Um, its theology is simple, like Judaism, really that there is one God and that God has spoken to us through his revelations. The first pillar is called the Shahada. This is a profession of faith that every Muslim must state in the presence of others in order to become a Muslim. Simply having, uh, sorry, simply saying this creed with sincerity is the only thing required to convert to Islam or to become a Muslim, whether you're raised in the faith or you're converting to it. Uh, the Shahada states that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. This is the summation of the Muslim belief system. The simplicity of the Muslim faith, as, as we mentioned before, is definitely one of the reasons that scholars believe it was able to spread so quickly. These words are also the first words that are whispered into a baby's uh, ears when they are born, so that they, the, the words, um, they're also words from the Quran, so that the words from the Quran will be the first thing that they hear. The second pillar is the daily prayer, which is called Salat. Muslims are required to pray five times a day. The prayer times are at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, evening, and just before bed. Each of these prayers have a specific form. There are specific words that one says and specific actions that one, do, that one does with, with his or her body. Basically cycles of standing, bowing, kneeling, and full prostration, which is touching your forehead to the ground. The prayers are also performed while facing Mecca. So every mosque, which is the um, Muslim house of worship, is actually oriented towards Mecca, so people will know which direction Mecca is at all times. Um, these prayers are different from personal supplication prayers, where Muslims just speak directly to God. That can be done at any time, but is separate from the five daily prayers. And usually that's done after the, the required obligatory prayer that has specific words and specific actions that everyone does. Uh, in Muslim countries, there are calls to prayer um, that are uh, broadcast from the, the mosques or even on the radio or on TV to remind people of the five daily prayers um, because they're not at specific times. The, the times of the prayers are set up uh, according to the sun. So depending on what time sunset was that day, that will set the rest of the day's prayers. And these um, calls to prayer um, will be done um, by a certain individual who is trained in uh, the call to prayer 
There are specific words and specific melodies that go with the call to prayer. Um, calls to prayer actually start with saying, God is greater. So the idea here is that it's a reminder that it's time to pray, and whatever you're doing, God is more important. So you can stop what you're doing for a few minutes and perform your daily prayer. The third pillar is giving to the poor, or zakat. Um, Muhammad was very concerned with the welfare of the poor, needy, and widows. So giving to the poor is performed to help the members of, the, of someone's society and to ensure that people do not become too attached to their own material possessions. Giving to the poor is done a bit differently um, than tithing in Christianity, which is sort of an institutionalized form of, of giving to charity. It is supposed to be performed once a year, and you're supposed to give 2.5% of all your assets. So this would be anything in your savings account, profits you've made, properties you own, etc. Uh, once a year, you're supposed to figure out what 2.5% of that would be and donate that to the poor. Um, this was the traditional way of doing it, although many Muslims don't necessarily do it in this same way. Um, they'll do it more so um, just sort of personal giving to, to certain charities that they agree with throughout the year and as opposed to the sort of one um, lump sum once a year, which can be more difficult for people to do. But in many Muslim countries, this is done largely through the government. The government has an institutionalized way um, to uh, organize this and, and to distribute the money to charities. The fourth pillar is fasting during the month of Ramadan or Salon. Ramadan is the month in which Muhammad first began receiving revelations from God, so it's a very important and holy month in Islam. During the entire month, Muslims are supposed to fast from sunup to sundown. So Muslims will wake up very early, like 4 or 5 in the morning, and eat a very large meal before the sun rises, then fast all day, which means no eating, no drinking any type of liquid, no smoking, no chewing gum, and also no sexual relations, until sunset. And then Muslims will again eat a very large meal called iftar to break the fast. The purpose behind the fast is to both remind Muslims of the plight of the hungry and to help them focus on spiritual instead of worldly matters. Ramadan is a time when Muslims are encouraged to really focus on spiritual concerns and be the best, the best version of themselves, the best Muslim, the best human being that they can be. Many Muslims will read the entire Quran during the month of Ramadan from sort of start to finish over that 30-day period and really just try to devote themselves wholeheartedly to their religious tradition and their spirituality. Everyone who is physically able to is required to fast, so actually children are not required to, people who are sick, traveling, or pregnant are, are not required to do this as well, so only those who are physically fit and able to do it. The fifth and last pillar is the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mecca is the most holy site to Muslims because Muhammad is from there and he set up his first kingdom or community there. It is also holy because it contains the Kaaba, which is a large black box that predates Islam and is believed to have been constructed by Abraham and Ishmael when they settled in Arabia. It also has a stone inside of it that's believed to have been given to Abraham and Ishmael from the angel Gabriel and is believed to be a stone from heaven. The stone sits in one corner of the Kaaba, and pilgrims can kiss it when they walk by. This is a common practice to touch it or kiss it. Although there are sort of concerns now about um, the stone itself being worn away by all the, the people who touch it or kiss it, so there are kind of new regulations on that, but that's a traditional, um, a traditional action to perform. The Kaaba was around before Islam, and was where all the tribes, as I mentioned before, would keep the statues of their gods. But when Mecca converted to Islam, uh, Muhammad actually went in and destroyed all of the idols, all of the statues of these gods, and left the Kaaba empty except for this one stone. So therefore it's believed to represent God in that it is empty and God cannot be portrayed in any physical form in Islam. That's um, very much prohibited in Islam to draw God or depict God in any physical way. Muslims are encouraged to go on, pilgrim, uh, on pilgrimage at least once in their lifetimes to Mecca if they are physically or financially able to. This is the same for men and women, and those who have gone on the Hajj describe it as an intensely spiritual experience and are very well respected when they return, even adding the title Haji onto their name. 
So someone who has been on the Hajj, who has been on the pilgrimage, um, their sort of social status is definitely elevated. It's a very respected thing to do to, to go on the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage itself lasts several days and involves several different actions, including circling around the Kaaba, visiting the site of the well that Gabriel is believed to have shown Hagar and Ishmael, um, visiting the site where Muhammad gave his final farewell to his community, and visiting the mountain where Abraham is believed to have sacrificed Ishmael instead of Isaac. Um, so there's a lot of different sort of group actions that happen over the course of the pilgrimage, um, and it's, it's sort of a set routine that lasts several days. And it's only one time during the year um, that, that's actually an official Hajj. You can go to Mecca at any other time, um, but performing the pilgrimage, performing the Hajj is only uh, at one specific time during the year. Uh, and finally, just to have a couple pictures if you've never seen it before, this black box here is the Kaaba. That's what the Kaaba looks like. Um, it's inside of a very large mosque, as you can see. And these pictures are taken during Hajj. So it's, it's a time when thousands and thousands of Muslims come to Mecca um, to perform the pilgrimage and, and um, come in and you know be near the Kaaba because it's considered the most holy site. And then the other picture up here in the corner is the picture of the stone, which as you can see is very much being worn away because uh, it's very traditional for people to touch the stone as they walk by it. Um, so, so that's considered to be a holy stone that, that came from heaven and was given by the angel Gabriel to Abraham and Ishmael.